Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I'm Colonel Dave Gray. I'm the director for the Center of Leadership and Ethics. We'd like to welcome you to Virginia Military Institute today and to our symposium, The Vietnam War at 50 Critical Reappraisals. We'll open this symposium with the posting of our national colors and the playing of our national anthem. Please rise. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated, and could we give a hand to our great cadet color guard. <clears throat> a generation ago, the United States, and many of you, were deeply engaged in hot fighting in South Vietnam. The Vietnam War remains the most controversial and consequential conflict of the post-World War II era. The war's outcomes profoundly impacted not just American domestic politics, but also the existing international order. The war fractured American consensus on political, social, and military affairs, prompting President Richard Nixon to say, no more Vietnams in the future. Controversies over the proper strategy and tactics to pursue, the quality of leadership and discipline in fighting units, the media's impact on popular support for the war, and the mistreatment of American prisoners of war raged then and continue even now. With 50 years perspective, this symposium will, will reflect on several of those issues. Now, today's event is part of the center's programming designed around this year's theme of courageous leadership. During the symposium, this sub-theme will be woven throughout. It is now my great pleasure to introduce VMI's 14th Superintendent, General Benford P. III, class of 1962, and a Vietnam veteran. Well, good morning, members of the 
Corps of Cadets, members of the academic board, faculty, and staff, guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this morning's symposium, the Vietnam War at 50, as Dave said, critical reappraisals, appraisals. And we are really honored to have with us today the Honorable James H. Webb, Jr., today's keynote speaker, whom I will have the pleasure to introduce in a few moments. We're gathered here to consider the meaning and lasting effects of the Vietnam War. That protracted conflict has been called many things, from the war to save Southeast Asia to the war we were not allowed to win. Every war this nation has engaged in has certainly ignited strong debate, including even the war for American independence. And putting the American Civil War aside, which quite literally tore the nation apart, no war in modern time, in my view, has quite divided our nation as has the war in Vietnam politically, socially, on the college campuses, and nearly every community. And although other recent wars, conflicts, and catalytic events have from time to time pushed the memory of the Vietnam War into the background, it persists and continues to divide and trouble us a half century later. <clears throat> The war, <clears throat> the war for us itself began in the early to mid-1960s. This year, 2018, marks the 50th anniversary of one of <clears throat> the great turning points in the war, the Tet Offensive of 1968, which, like so many aspects of that conflict, looked to some as a last de desperate act of the North Vietnamese and to others as the beginning of the end for the Allies. With that event, the direction of the war changed significantly. And although not specifically targeted to events in 1968, this symposium will examine many of the key concerns of that general period. The Vietnam War continues to reverberate in our society and has affected political, strategic, operational, and tactical decision-making ever since, nationally and, and honestly in our services as well. This symposium takes advantage of five decades of perspective and we'll examine a few of the major themes of the war, including military strategy, small unit leadership, the prisoner war experience, and the expanded effect of the media on public perceptions of the war. The staff of our Center for Leadership and Ethics has brought together some of the nation's top experts on the war, as well as many veterans to share their knowledge with you. Many of you have personal experiences of the war as veterans, as reporters, as scholars, or have deep memories of living through that particular era. And I hope that <coughs> you will share your experiences and provide insight and lessons that may benefit the future and that our selection of topics will encourage critical thinking and further conversation about the war and its effect long term on our country. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I would like to thank Martin and Jerry Kaminsky for their generous support of this symposium. Regretfully, Jerry could not be with us today, but his brother is, and I ask Marty if you'd please stand and receive our thanks for supporting this important symposium. <clears throat> our keynote speaker, James H. Webb, Jr., is a veteran who led, fought in, thought deeply on, and wrote about the war. Subsequently, he dealt with the conflict's aftermath while serving in key government posts. The son of a military family, Senator Webb graduated from the United States Naval Academy, graduating in the historic year 1968. In his service in Vietnam as a Marine, he received the Navy Cross, the Silver Star, two Bronze Stars with Combat V, and two Purple Hearts, and is one of the most highly decorated Marines in that war. After retiring from the Marine Corps due to injuries received in Vietnam, he attended law school at Georgetown University where he earned the Juris Doctor. He then worked on the staff of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs and taught at the Naval Academy. During the Reagan administration, he served as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs from 1984 to 1987. And in 1987, he was appointed Secretary of the Navy, becoming the first Naval Academy graduate to serve as a civilian head of our Navy. In 2006, he was elected senator from Virginia and served on the Foreign Relations, Armed Services, 
Veterans Affairs and Joint Economic Committees, the major committees of our Senate. He wrote, introduced, and guided to passage the post-9-11 bill, the most significant veterans legislation since World War II. He retired from the Senate in 2011. He has several times been mentioned as possible vice president and presidential candidate. Senator Webb is the author of 10 books, most notably Field of Fire and a Sense of Honor. He has twice been nominated for a Pulitzer. He has received more than 30 national awards for community service, including the Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service. I cannot say that I am welcoming him here to VMI this morning because I'm actually welcoming him back to VMI, this being his third visit. He spoke to the Corps of Cadets in Cameron Hall on our Founders Day in 1986 and to the Marshall Awards sem Seminar in 2008 in J.M. Hall. Please give a warm welcome back, Senator and Mr. Secretary, Mr. Webb. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, General P, for your own service to our country and to this institution, and uh, also for uh, inviting me to participate in this day. Um, talking about the Vietnam War is kind of like uh, getting someone's reaction to a, Yor a Rorschach test. Everyone has their own feelings about it. You throw something up, and uh, people are going to have their own reactions. Uh, you have a, a lot of uh, people who have spent great portions of their lives uh, working on this issue, many here having actually served in Vietnam and some of the members of the panel having been uh, in Vietnam as journalists or have, having dedicated to careers to uh, studying the history of it. Uh, I was thinking that the best thing that I could do in this short period of time that we have 30 minutes is a little bit long for a speech, but uh, trying to put 10 years into 30 minutes is uh, a challenge, would be to uh, lay out my own thoughts on three different areas. Uh, was our effort in South Vietnam morally and strategically justifiable? I believe it was. Uh, was the United States military effective? on this battlefield, and I believe it was. And finally, did the outcome of the war validate our reasons for having fought it? And I believe uh, very much that it did. I did not go to Vietnam. I'm sure, may, how many ask, may I ask you how many people in this room served in Vietnam during the war? I think uh, many would probably agree with this. I did not go to Vietnam with a lot of political uh, uh, intentions or even uh, uh, political experience other than to watching our national figures, but I knew what I wanted to do, and that was I, w I wanted to serve my country. I wanted to lead the people I was supposed to lead. I wanted to do the job I was supposed to do, and our leaders were going to take care of the, uh, the rest of it, and someday I would come back and tell you what I thought of overall of the Vietnam War, and we've had the uh, time to reflect on this. We've had the ability over the years to watch the cycle of the war and its aftermath, and I think uh, I can say very comfortably that uh, the outcome of this war uh, certainly justified the reasons that we went into this. I don't want to, uh, I'm going to try to leave about 15 minutes for questions. I, I really, like Ronald Reagan, I don't like to answer what if questions. I think we could ask what if questions uh, of if we had done this or if we'd done that, would things have come out differently? I would like to uh, report to you uh, my observations on uh, facts that did occur, how they affected uh, the outcome of the war, the, the policy in the war, the outcome of the war, and then uh, see what other people think. I. Uh, Ask for a map. Okay. Now, uh, for those of you um, cadets uh, who are looking at this issue uh, the, for the first time or maybe for the second time, that's a time period uh, in many of our lives when we started uh, looking at Vietnam. I think the best place for us to start, 
And for the people who were in Vietnam, they will remember this. For those of you who are starting to look at the war, uh, maybe you haven't been taught or, uh, or maybe this hasn't been brought to your attention in a strong enough way that really Vietnam, if you look at this map of Southeast Asia, and I hope my mic works, I wanna, I wanna come over here so I can uh, do some uh, pointing on here. If you take a look at this region, the Southeast Asia region, it is the most dynamic region in the world. And at the end of World War II, because of a number of factors, there were economic and political vacuums throughout this region. Uh, Japan had occupied portions of China after, uh, after uh, the uh, Pearl Harbor time period. It had actually occupied a big piece of this whole area here. At the end of World War II, the Japanese military receded all the way back into Japan, leaving one set of vacuums. The European colonial uh, powers who had owned different pieces or occupied different pieces of this region, many of, many of them had returned or, or dramatically reduced their presence uh, in the region, leaving political vacuums. Uh, we had, uh, obviously, the British, India, Burma, uh, all the way over, uh, over into uh, Sri Lanka, Australia, a different set of circumstances in Australia. You had the Dutch in Indonesia. Uh, Malaysia was British. Um, Vietnam, Indochina, obviously French. Uh, China was seeing uh, the end of a long struggle complicated by Japanese uh, presence in China over the 30s and into the 40s between nationalist and communist entities. All of this region was in flux. In Vietnam, as many of us have studied, the French initially came back into Vietnam. They left uh, until a communist moved in in 1945. They decided that this uh, needed to be in some way responded to. And that was how we began, not us, but that's how this war, this present Vietnam War, began. Um, there was something of a domino theory in effect. It became mocked during the war, but the, the stability of this entire region was in play. And I uh, would like to throw out a quote by Lee Kuan Yew, who was, I think, one of the most brilliant individuals in the late 20th and early 21st uh, century. Um, he was the creator of what we would call modern day Singapore, the brilliant mind behind it, the strong leader behind it, who always insisted, uh, recently passed away, that what the United States did in Vietnam allowed the rest of this region to stabilize politically uh, and to stabilize economically and to begin to grow to the point that now something like 30% of the the world trade comes through these avenues in here. So in the context of the region and in the context of the United States interest in the region, we can even quote David Halberstam, who later became opposed to the war in 1964 when he wrote that Vietnam is one of the four or five most important countries to the United States in Asia. I happen to agree with that. We also had the situation globally with communist expansionism, not uh, simply uh, through philosophy, but through the common turn in Moscow designed to uh, globally expand the concept and the governing principles behind it. We stayed for many years. Many people in this room who were in the army during the Cold War spent many years in West Germany. We spent many years with, with dividing line between East and West Germany waiting for the time that Germany might be reunited under the right sort of political principles. We had the same experience in Korea, uh, which had been occupied by the Japanese until the end of World War II, and which saw uh, a communist invasion in 1950, and our uh, reactions to attempt to uh, expel 
that invasion, which resulted in a divided Korea, uh, North Korea, South Korea. So the, uh, the notion of a divided Vietnam between communist and non-communist forces was not illogical to the events that were going on in this region and in Indochina uh, during the time that the French returned and up until the time that we uh, uh, assisted in the uh, division of the country in 1954. Now, there are a lot of people who say, it was popular during the war, that Ho Chi Minh was simply a nationalist uh, who wanted to ride on the back of a communist uh, philosophy in order to unite the country. I think the truth of this is shown by the fact that Ho Chi Minh spent years in the common turn in Moscow studying the philosophies of international uh, communist expansion. It's kind of ironic. I was reading a book um, by Stephen Kotkin called Stalin, who's writing a three a book series, a brilliant book. And I, um, in the period in the 1920s, it was sort of just ironic reading through the pages, and there was a note in there where uh, Stalin was making a presentation to the Comintern in 1924 and was interrupted by a uh, member of the Comintern representing French Indochina saying that the way to worldwide global revolution was through the colonial uh, effort. Um, when the uh, Viet Minh came out of the mountains in the 1940s, and the uh, communist government announced that it was going to be the government of Vietnam, there were many uh, Vietnamese who were nationalists, anti-French nationalists, but also anti-communists, uh, who were eliminated, uh, particularly in the North when this first began. So the, the Viet Minh also helped, were helped, uh, after the end of the Korean War, the Korean War armistice in 1953, particularly if you read Bernard Fall, uh, held in a very small place about the siege of Dien Bien Phu, when the uh, French forces in Dien Bien Phu, up here, uh, were uh, assisted by transfer of armaments out of Korea, uh, artillery armaments, heavy mortars, these sorts of things, that uh, dramatically assisted in the surprise of the fall of the, at the siege of Dien Bien Phu. So long story short, after that, the uh, country was divided in 1954. More than a million people in the North were able to go to the South, the people who did not want to live under communism. A relatively small group of people went from the, north, from the South to the North, and many, many of them were cadre, communist cadre, who were getting uh, trained uh, to reinvade in the South, and they did beginning in 1958. And again, historically, it's kind of ironic that when, when people talk about the division of Vietnam uh, in 1954, that uh, in 1630, the South Vietnamese erected a wall only six miles away from where the DMZ was and that wall lasted for about 150 years with periodic uh, you know, truces and these sorts of things. But the, the location and the concept was not new to what was going on after uh, 1954. After the failed election process in 1956, the uh, uh, communist cadres started moving back across the DMZ, particularly very heavy in the central sections of, uh, the, of the country, the northern sections of South Vietnam. This caused difficulties for United States policy. Uh, the John Kennedy particularly was very vocal about Vietnam being the strongest, number, the number one foreign policy uh, issue for the United States and Asia at that time. And in fact, in late 1961, uh, it was John Kennedy who started increasing the number of troops, troops in Vietnam. And when he did that, he pointed out uh, in his speech that the communist cadres were assassinating 4,000 government officials uh, a year, 11 government officials a day. 
during that period. This is a concept of targeted assassination terrorism that I don't think our country fully grasped at that time. Uh, 11 government officials a day was about like an Oklahoma City bombing a day. When the Gulf of Tonkin incident occurred in 1964, and actually it was in my, my plebe summer at the Naval Academy, I remember coming back from boxing class and having to pick up the Washington Post and, and learn the three headlines of the day, and there was a picture of the Gulf of Tonkin. There's been a lot of discussion about the Gulf of Tonkin, but North Vietnamese units were already uh, moving into the, uh, into the South in 1964. So that, those were the steps that brought us into full-size combat in Vietnam, beginning particularly in 1965 with the landing of more uh, uh, ground forces. Were we effective on the battlefield? The war, obviously, as those who have studied it and those who were there know, varied year by year, location by location, service by service. Um, I would uh, like to make a comment right now about all of the soldiers from all the sides who, who fought in this war. Uh, these were very good soldiers. The North Vietnamese, as many in this room know, were very good soldiers. They also had political uh, commissars all the way down to the company level, continually indoctrinating them on the reasons that they were doing what they were doing. I will say to you, my view, having grown up in the military, uh, that the United States military leadership that took us into Vietnam was the finest leadership in depth in the history of our country. Uh, these were individuals, so many of them, who had fought extensively in World War II in Korea. Uh, they knew how to handle tactical situations. They knew how to lead. Um, I served under three regimental commanders as a Marine Rifle Platoon and Company commander. I served under four battalion commanders, all three of my regimental commanders had served in combat in World War II in Korea. Three of the four battalion commanders I had had served in combat in Korea. Uh, these were great troop leaders. On the communist and Arvin side, one of the things that I've liked to, liked to point out over the years is that I, what Ho Chi Minh uh, would, used to say, Doc Lap Huzal, independence and freedom. The communists were fighting for independence and freedom. I like to say, having spent a lot of time working with the Vietnamese community here and learning so much more about the complexities of why this war was fought, and having spent parts of 27 out of the last 28 years inside Vietnam, that we can certainly respect uh, the North Vietnamese and the communists for their concept of Doc Lap, national independence, but we also, and they also, need to respect those who fought on the other side against communism for Tutsal, which is freedom. And I think uh, that both of those issues continue to resonate today when we discuss not only the war, but the aftermath of the war. Uh, a lot of people talk about the body count. I remember in Vietnam, and coming, coming back from Vietnam, it was all about falsifications on the body count. You know, the, this body count is too high, and of course, this is how uh, our war was being measured here in the media and uh, in the Pentagon in some cases, how many, how many of the enemy were killed. Uh, and it was sort of interesting, in 1965, excuse me, 1995, when uh, we normalized relations with Vietnam, Hanoi admitted that it had lost 1.4 million soldiers to the war, 1.4 million. The United States lost 58,000. The Arvin lost 245,000. Um, there were some elusive wily guerrillas out there, but there were also a lot of uh, enemy soldiers who did not make it home. Um, in terms of fighting the war itself, um, I'd say from an American perspective, and. Uh, largely from a Marine Corps perspective. Uh, this war, uh, was the intensity of this, and the, the length of the intensity in, in these uh, operations was almost unparalleled in American history. 
uh, for the United States Marine Corps. Uh, these are statistics out of the history of the Marine Corps by Alan Millett. Uh, Marine Corps total casualties in Vietnam were higher than any other war, including World War II. There were more killed in World War II. Um, 19,733 Marines were killed in World War II, 67,000 wounded for a total of 90,709 uh, in Vietnam. 13,000 killed in action, 88,591 wounded for a total of 103,000. Um, the peak years for ground fighting were 67 through 69 for the, uh, for the United States forces. Um, you can actually see a bell curve when you, when you look at American casualties in those, those three years, actually 68 by by far was the highest year for American casualties. 69 was second and 67 was third, but 67 and 69 were, were almost, uh, almost equal. Uh, when I was getting ready to go to Vietnam, um, finishing basic school, we had a, a lieutenant colonel at basic school who took us aside. He had just come back from a tour as a battalion commander in Vietnam. He'd served in Iwo Jima as an enlisted Marine uh, he was a Navy Cross recipient in the Korean War, and he sat us down. We had 71 uh, lieutenants in my basic class who were going to be infantry uh, officers. And he said, you need to understand something about what your troops are going through. This is the hardest war that the Marine Corps has ever fought in terms of living conditions, length of time uh, out in the, in the battlefield, sickness, plus the types of fighting uh, that our Marines are doing. It's a pretty stunning comment. Um, and in, in my view, I, I think I can't, I wasn't in any of these other wars, but the great failure, one of the two or three great failures in our society has been not to recognize the, the, the human cost of our uh, infantry people particularly, but for, of our people who served uh, in this war. The interesting thing about the uh, casualties, when you break down the Marine Corps casualties, is you know, there are basically two or three battles in Vietnam that are fairly well remembered, uh, Marine Corps battles that are fa fairly well remembered um, when people write and talk about the war. But if you look at the, where the spread of casualties, uh, the Marine Corps fought in five provinces and Quang Nam, uh, which was west of Da Nang, had more casualties than any of the uh, other provinces of the uh, 14,000 Marines who died in total in Vietnam. 6,480 died in Quang Nam, and there's not one memorable battle that you can really come to when you, when you, when you look at that area, but it was constant, a platoon, uh, squad, sometimes company size engagements. At, at times, you know, we could hit anything walking out, and anything from one person with a grenade to the 90th NVA regiment. You never knew what you were going to hit. But those types of continuous engagements um, at the low unit level characterize the way that the war was fought uh, on the ground in, in Vietnam. At any given day, um, in those environments, on the ground environments, our Marines and soldiers were fighting three different wars. And you had to be ready for all three. One was a war of terrorism. Uh, the, the targeted assassinations of people who were affiliated with the South Vietnamese government. Uh, this was a continuum, and it was, I think of the, of the two strategic uh, failings in the war, uh, for us on the ground, that was, that was one. I don't think we, I say that myself too, I don't think we focused enough attention on how to control that type of uh, conduct. We're, we're better at it now because we've seen it constantly, particularly in, in Iraq and also in Afghanistan, but it wasn't as, in, as uh, proper a place in our examination and in our intelligence at, at the uh, 
battalion level in the infantry units where, uh, where I served. Um, the second war was a guerrilla war, classic guerrilla war, with a population that, that was being both threatened and rewarded if they aligned themselves with the guerrillas. And the third was a traditional conventional war. And, and as I said, on any given day in Huayam, Arizona Valley, uh, Anwa Basin, and many, many other places, our, our people, our, our uh, soldiers, our Marines were facing that on a, on a constantly. The second, uh, in retrospect, the second strategic shortcoming I believe uh, that, that we had was in the way that we used strategic bombing. Our competence of all of our uh, tactical pilots, uh, strategic bombing pilots, is beyond question. Uh, the way that they were used, I think, was a little short-sighted. And what I mean by that is um, take, for instance, arc lights. There are places where uh, they were properly used to be 52 arc lights, say around Quezon. Uh, but we never dropped B-52 arc lights in Hanoi or in the areas around the north until December 1972. They never went higher than about Vin, up in the central part of uh, uh, Vietnam. Was that a failing? Should we have? Well, I will, I will say this. We dropped arc lights on Gonoi Island, where I was, <laughs> west of Da Nang in the south, on populated areas when, we, when they had uh, large troop movements coming out of the Khoisan Mountains. Um, now, when I started going back to Vietnam in the 90s, one of the first things that, that uh, the Vietnamese in Hanoi would, would want to talk about was the eight days that uh, B-52s bombed Hanoi in 1972. If you don't, if you don't want to bomb uh, the enemy's strong points, uh, then what are you doing bombing your friend's strong points? I think we could have done a much better job, a uh, much more effective job. Everyone in Hanoi remembers those eight days. The way that we were using our tactical aircraft to, to bomb in the north, uh, in fact, created, I think, the illusion uh, among the North Vietnamese that they were withstanding American air power uh, and it actually became a uh, uh, sort of a, a, a sort of strengthened resolve rather than for them to understand what really uh, this American uh, military was capable of if it were used in a different way. Um, another interesting piece is how the communists were so smart in using election years to shape their own uh, military operations. 1964, coming into the election season, they started moving into the south. We had the Gulf of Tonkin. Boom. 1968, the Tet Offensive knocked Lyndon Johnson out of power. 1972 was the Easter Offensive. Uh, we were largely gone, but it was huge uh, offensive against uh, our South Vietnamese uh, allies. And finally, when President Nixon was forced to resign in 1974, we saw what I believe was the most shameful vote in the United States Congress uh, when uh, the Watergate Congress, the Congress that was elected after Nixon's resignation and its, one of its very first votes uh, voted to cut off $800 million in supplemental funding to the South Vietnamese military. This was, uh, there was no reason to do that. There was none. There's beans, bullets, band-aids, uh, you know, the medical assistance, artillery out to where, where these units were positioned, cut off funding for them. They had to readjust their military, and that was when the North Vietnamese 55-day uh, invasion hit, and South Vietnam fell. And that's, frankly, if I may say it, that's normally where most discussions, uh, TV discussions and books tend to end when they talk about the Vietnam War, April 30th, 1975. Let's talk about the outcome of that war. Let's talk about what happened after 1975, because for me, I believe it validates the reasons 
that we went into Vietnam. And it also gives us, I think, a, a little bit of resolve to make sure that our interests uh, in, in Vietnam, our long-term strategic interests in the, in the Valley of Vietnam, are not thrown by the wayside. 1975, uh, April of, the communists take over. Hundreds of thousands of South Vietnamese jump into boats, into the, into the sea. There's never been, for all the war, there's never been this kind of a diaspora of the Vietnamese people in 2,000 years. This continued for years, and yet all the way up 1978, 79, they were jumping into the ocean with a 50% chance of dying. Uh, trying to uh, move away from a Stalinist system that had taken place at that time. Among them was my wife, who's here today, uh, Hong, whose entire family, uh, extended family, uh, got on a boat. Her father was a fisherman, uh, spent three days at sea, did not know if they were going to live or die, were scooped up by the United States Navy, brought to a refugee camp on Guam, and then to another one in Arkansas. She was able to uh, grow up in the, spent, or grow up the rest of her growing up in New Orleans, ended up uh, graduating from Cornell Law School. Uh, that's the story of uh, the Vietnamese, uh, what they could do under the right political system inside Vietnam, and it's a great, uh, it's a great reminder of what we were, we were trying to do. Inside Vietnam, after 1975, a million of the young leadership of South Vietnam were put into re-education camps. You know, I, I can talk to people all across uh, political, geographical lines, and the educational lines in this country, and very few of them even know that the communists put uh, people into re-education camps. Hundreds of thousands of them stayed longer than four years. I have a friend who stayed 13 and a half years in re-education. Five of those years, he was in a conics box. Um, his children were not allowed to go to school beyond a certain point, and so many of these were the, were the cream of the uh, leadership in the anti-communist anti side. Um, there was a large Soviet presence that moved into Vietnam after 1975. Uh, much of it uh, naval, but uh, also uh, a a aviation assets. Um, when I was Secretary of the Navy, in the 19, late 1980s, on any given day, uh, there were about 25 Soviet combatant ships in Cameron Bay. You know, Russia has always dreamed of uh, having warm water ports in the Pacific. They had them uh, for quite a while. What stopped all this? What turned it around? Uh, the Soviet Union started falling apart. The Soviets were um, subsidizing the Vietnamese economy billions of dollars a year uh, until the Soviet Union fell apart. And this, this was the story of what we were trying to prevent from happening. But once the Soviet Union fell apart, this became, I think, our greatest opportunity uh, in terms of what we really want to see, what we really want to see, what we were really fighting, really fighting for was a strategic relationship uh, a harmonious relationship with one of the four or five most important uh, countries in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, the Vietnamese government, when the Soviet Union started falling apart, ran out of money, uh, announced a policy called Doi Moi, a new, new way, you know, new change, uh, and s started slowly opening up their society Vietnam had existed during the period that we just talked about for 16 years behind a bamboo curtain once the communists took over. You, you couldn't have a uh, thoughtful journalism visit there. They were, they were very careful about who personally could visit there. Um, they started opening up slowly, um, and I, have, I am pleased to have been a process working with the Vietnamese here and working with the, the government over there. I've been a part of this process of, of trying to move uh, our country forward with, with Vietnam um, because uh, if, we, if we went into this place saying it's 
one of the four or five most important countries, and we need to work with the system that is running that country in order to liberalize that system and have strategic relationships over there at a time when we're seeing other dramatic changes. What are those dramatic changes? And I will stop with this if I can kick that back. Go back one more time. This will be old news to a lot of people here, but if you look right here, the Korean Peninsula is here. This is the, China's here, Russia's here, Japan's here. This is the only geographical location in the world where the interests of those three major powers intersect. And there's been a constant rev revolution uh, revolving uh, nature of which one of those uh, countries has been the, the top country in terms of seeking dominance out here. Obviously, the last 20 years, that has been China. I've been speaking for, for years about the South China Sea, these countries down here, which China now claims as sovereign uh, territory for China. Uh, the Vietnamese have been working with us, um, closely with us, to, as, as one of the countries attempting to uh, change that. We've been seeing a reduction in the, uh, the former autocracy of this government. There's still a communist government. We, you know, we're not going to see that go away any, anytime soon. Uh, but we're seeing more openness, uh, more trade, uh, and frankly, uh, more friendship, we hope. So that, this, this is why we were there, in my view. This is how we uh, uh, proceeded during a very difficult, costly, and controversial war. These are the reasons that I believe uh, what the people who went to Vietnam uh, deserve a lot more respect than they have received, and I believe that history will vindicate that, and this is what we need to do moving forward. And with that, I will take your questions. Some, uh, Colonel? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator and Mr. Secretary. Um, I was on the ground with the 101st Airborne. I was in the infantry, and then after a few months of being a line soldier, I became the, uh, the civil affairs NCO for the battalion. Spent a lot of time out in, in uh, villages and, and with uh, the local Vietnamese forces and whatever. And it says it's on. Well, it had, it had a green light before. <laughs> anyway, sorry, yeah, I just gotta get closer. Um, my, and I, I perceive there, there were really uh, two radically different populations in Vietnam, meaning the Catholics and the Buddhists. Catholics were essentially 100% behind us. The Buddhists uh, were not behind us. And of course, a lot of that had to do f with the intimidation, you know, from, from the uh, Viet Cong and the, and the NVA. Right. But um, I did not see, I did not perceive that we really had much chance of... Can I ask you to shorten your question because we're going to get yeah, I'm sorry. more in. That, you know, how would we have succeeded in getting the Buddhist... Okay, support? I got you. Yeah. The, the question, you know, the, the question is in the, in, where were you? Where uh, was this? I was mostly in, in three core, uh, War Zone D, Triang Bank okay. Quarter, you know. No. Well, you yeah. know, the... I'd love to have a couple hours to, to talk about yeah, these kinds of things. <clears throat> but, um, you know, I've worked with, with the Vietnamese extensively since 1980. The Vietnamese here. Some are Catholic. My wife's Catholic. Uh, some, many, many, many are Buddhist. Uh, some worked with the French. Some did not. Um, and I'll, I, will, I will tell you, when, if you go back to where you were uh, during the war, well, I, I mentioned this very quickly at the beginning when these assassination squads came down and, uh, and uh, you know, guerrilla, however John Kennedy uh, characterized them. 
but they had in these villages out like for instance where, where we were they had their fights 1958 to 62 and the people who were with the communists stayed they dug in uh, most of those areas obviously were Buddhist areas, but there are a lot of them that left. Uh, they, they were pro-government. Uh, in, in place like uh, Gonoi Island, I've got a good friend here who uh, was a native of Gonoi Island where I fought. I fought his village three times, it turned out. But the, the pro-South Vietnamese government people moved back into the enclaves. He, his family moved to Da Nang, and then after Da Nang, they moved to, to, to Saigon. So what you're seeing out there in those villages, and by the way, just for categorization, for, for those of you who haven't heard of this, we categorize villages, there's a lot of talk about you could shoot at anything, which is, is really not true. Okay? Um, we, had, we categorize these villages category A, which is completely government controlled, say Da Nang, category E, completely Viet Cong controlled, and then category five, which is absolutely politically hopeless, these people are hardcore, and that's where we had, we didn't have to get a political clearance if we, if we had a fire mission, if we were in contact and those sorts of things. So those, those areas would be Buddhist and, and they would be anti-South Vietnamese government, anti-American, et cetera. But that's not really true of the Buddhist population at large. I, I, can, I can tell you that from experience. Senator Wolf, what was your opinion of the Kim Burns series on Vietnam? I didn't watch it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm told he didn't really talk about it after 1975, uh, all these things that are so important. Um, but, uh, I'd like to ask you a speculative what if question, get your opinion. If John F. Kennedy had lived, if John F. Kennedy had been reelected in 1964 for the another four years to 1968, how do you think things may have been different or the same? I don't think we'll ever know that. No, I really don't. I say that in all due respect to your question. You know, he made a pretty strong statement in 1961 and, you know, in terms of what the, uh, the threat was, and this, this is just playing table. You know, this whole region was a playing table. I have, I have no idea what, how that would have turned out. Uh, Senator, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your remarks. They're uh, uh, very perceptive, and uh, I wish we had more of that in our, our public life. I wish we had more time too. Uh, uh, actually, here's my question. Uh, wasn't the most critical aspect of the war the war for the hearts and minds of the South Vietnamese people? And wasn't that an aspect of the war that we could not fight or win? It had to be won, if at all, by the South Vietnamese government. And regrettably, South Vietnam never was able to establish a stable government that garnered uh, the, the enthusiastic support of a sufficient critical mass of the South Vietnamese. And therefore, no matter what we did, and I, I agree with you, for most of the war, I think we tried to do the best we could do, and I think the people here will agree with that. But the critical war was the war that we couldn't win. Well, can I, let me, I know what you're saying, so, uh, uh, and we're short on time. Let me, let me just say, uh, I, I read that all the time. Um, but my view, and I've, I've traveled all through Vietnam, I, I, in, in one trip in 1992, literally, we drove from Hanoi up to Haiphong all the way to the Cambodian border. I, I speak Vietnamese. I spoke a lot better Vietnamese in the 90s than I do now. But I, I, my Vietnamese is good enough to just go out and talk to people without, you know, the government escort, who happens in many cases to be an interior, interior ministry figure, um, uh, you know, monitoring everything that, that, that they say. My, my view is that there are, there are like four different constituencies in, in Vietnam during the war um, and in, in some cases since the war. Um, in the north, they sent a lot of soldiers and they lost a lot of soldiers and, and they really did not feel the day-to-day -day brunt uh, of, of the war. In the south, and they were, obviously, they were with that side. In the south, meaning the 
area around you know, Saigon and, 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 and out, they're 90% with us. Uh, I, when I got back to Vietnam in 1991, I, I, uh, I came in with, with Senator Bob Kerry. He, he asked me to come with him as a friend. I was a, uh, not in government at the time because I'd worked with the, the, the Vietnamese. And I, I stayed when he left, and I just got two sick low guys, both of them are former Arvin, just to drive me around. And it was like the victory parade we never had. These people were coming out of the woodwork. You know, they, they hadn't seen Americans for 15 years, and they were coming out crying. Some of them, you grabbed me on the street. You know, we always knew you'd come back. Um, very, you know, very powerful support for what we were doing. In the middle, where I fought, Central Vietnam, it was kind of like Kentucky and Tennessee in the Civil War. You know, they were divided, and they're hard, hard, hard people on both sides. And they really took it out on each other during the war and once the, the, the communists won the, on, the, on the people who uh, were on the other side. Um, there were, there were uh, just directly to your, you know, we can't go back and, and replay this, but um, you know who David Hackworth was? David Hackworth uh, uh, was a very, uh, you know, in, in, in some ways, you know, he, he uh, you know, people like him or didn't like him, you know, uh, but uh, he left Vietnam, he, had, uh, he left Vietnam, I think, in 71 under a cloud. Um, he was a very t terrific soldier, but, you know, had his own way of doing some other things. But he was saying in 1971, if the communists are gonna win, but if you'd have paid attention to the new generation of leadership, which basically is our age, who, ha who have been uh, raised militarily under, you know, uh, uh, listening to the, the mentorship of how the American military worked and what the American military system was, if they had another five, six years, then that the, the South Vietnamese army would have solidified. And I know after Vietnamization, when Nixon announced Vietnamization, I was a company commander, and we worked. We had, they hadn't sent the Arvins out to places like the Arizona Valley, and I worked with two different Arvin units out there. The first one was a ranger, ranger unit, and it kind of got kicked around. The second one was uh, 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 the 51st Arvin Regiment, and they were together. They were a really, really uh, fine uh, unit. So uh, it's, it's, you know, I think, it, well, I'm getting into the what ifs, but I think, let's just say there were considerable people uh, who believed that the communist system was not what they wanted, um, and, you know, I mean, there's no, no, there's really nothing more I can say with the time that we have about that. Yes, sir. Oh, well. <laughs> My dad um, was a B-17, B-29 guy and uh, didn't have a college degree. He got a college degree my senior year in high school, but very, very fine officer, uh, missile officer. Uh, <clears throat> got deep selected for colonel after he finally got his degree. They brought him to the Pentagon in 1965. They brought him to the Pentagon. He worked in congressional affairs. And uh, he, uh, uh, you know, he had op opinions about what was happening with the, the civilian leadership in there at that time, which probably wouldn't surprise you. I, sh I think I should just leave it at <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sir, thank you for your great strategic insights and for sharing some of your personal stories. You've now set a great context for the rest of the conference, and we appreciate you taking the time to come share with us today. So on behalf of the superintendent, the staff and faculty, and the Corps of Cadets, please accept this small token of our appreciation. Well, thank you. Thank and you. I know you'll have a great conference today. you got some really good people talking to you. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, what we'd like to do now is take a 10-minute break. We're going to switch up things today to keep you moving around. But our next session will be back in here. And uh, at 9.15. So thank you very much. <laughs>